testing. Okay, let's get started. Okay, quiet down. <laughs> All right, so on behalf of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness, welcome to the debate on whether hierarchical predictive coding explains perception. The center, jointly directed by Dave Chalmers, who's over there, uh, with the very able help of John Simon, who's around here somewhere there, over there, um, has had eight previous debates, uh, one on the role of built-in structure and in artificial intelligence, uh, one on unconscious perception, the replicability crisis, innate concepts, neuroaesthetics, mirror neurons, um, whether moral um, psychology and moral neuroscience has anything to say to ethics, um, and uh, one on top-down effects on perception. We've also had a number of workshops on animal consciousness, the ethics of AI, the Bayesian brain, borderline states of consciousness, and the brain mapping initiative. Um, so our debaters today include two philosophers and two scientists. We intend there to be one of each field on each side of the debate. Of course, intending does not make it so. Uh, and one of the issues, if not the main issue, is what hierarchical predictive coding actually is. If, predict if hierarchical predictive coding is just predictive processing, then all of our debaters are probably on the same side, since probably all would agree that perception involves a great deal of prediction. Prediction that can be thought of in traditional Bayesian terms is the contribution of the representation of prior probabilities to hypotheses about the environment. I expect that one locus of disagreement may be whether the hierarchical predictive coding approach is in fact different from standard Bayesian approaches to perception. Predictive coding advocates sometimes say that perception is controlled hallucination, a description that doesn't seem apt if priors are simply used to modify bottom-up signals, but we'll see what, the, uh, what our speakers have to say about that. Another issue that may arise is whether the predictive coding approach can be generalized to the entire mind. For example, as proposed by Carl Friston, the predictive coding approach also applies to motivation and action. The generation of action being the minimization of the prediction error between what you predict you will do and what you are doing. Um, the order of speakers will be Andy Clark, David Heeger, uh, Lucia Maloney, and Michael Rescorla. Andy Clark is a professor of logic and metaphysics at the University of Edinburgh. He's the author of Surfing Uncertainty, which could be described as a predictive coding manifesto. Uh, David Heeger is Silver Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at NYU, specializing in computational theories of neuronal processing. Lucia Maloney is a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt am Main and a research assistant professor at NYU's Langone Medical Center. She's worked on consciousness and perceptual learning in addition to predictive coding. Michael Rescorla is professor of philosophy at UCLA, specializing in philosophy of mind, logic, and language. He's written on uh, Bayesian approaches to perception and decision, including a critique of Carl Friston's approach to motor control. So each of our debaters will make an initial statement of 15 minutes. Then all of them will coalesce on the stage, and we will ask for very brief reactions from them. Then we will open the floor to um, uh, uh, questions from the audience. So our first speaker is Andy Clark. Okay, so thank you so much for, um, for having me here. Um, so I'm just going to try and say what I think this story is and sort of separate out what I think is the core of it from what I think are just implementation details. Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Okay. How about that? Good. Okay. Okay. So let's just start off very general stuff. No red pixels in that image. Probably, um, probably people are seeing kind of reddish things there. And there's a, a long-standing story about why something like that might be so. Long-standing story going back to Helmholtz, um, Ulrich Neisser, Richard Gregory, and others, is that we don't just passively perceive the world. What we do is we build our percepts of the world in context using stuff that we know about the world. So there's a very, very general sort of picture there. 
And I think there's a recent version of that picture. It's not the only version. There are many others, as, uh, as Ned was saying. But a version of it is hierarchical predictive coding. And what I'm going to say here is what I meant by predictive processing. So anyone that's been reading Surfing Uncertainty and thinks predictive processing is broader than this wasn't really supposed to be. It was supposed to be this, but with action and motivation, which I'm not talking about today. So the idea here is that brains are prediction machines, multi-level prediction machines, and that percepts are built in a complicated nonlinear way out of predictions that are gently tweaked by corrective feedback from the incoming sensory information. So this is the thing that Ned was gesturing at, perception as controlled hallucination. The idea is that all the heavy lifting, all the hard work, is being done by the non-linear construction of the percept, and the sensory information is a kind of a, a fast way of correcting that construction. Okay. So the, the beating heart of these stories, the thing that I, I would bet money on, is that probabilistic generative models play a big role in human cognition. Um, a generative model, as it features here, is something that's got the capacity to construct kind of versions of the data for itself using stuff that is known about the world. In general, the ones that I'd be looking at here would be, they'd have a kind of compositionality written into them. So you'd know enough to sort of create versions of the data for yourself. Working a bit more like a computer graphics program than a standard classifier or pattern recognizer. So lots of examples, an image grammar, a probabilistic generative model for images, expose multi-layer neural networks to enough training images, get them to try and generate versions of those images for themselves that can pass the test for being real images of the world, perhaps using another network. So some of this work is generative adversarial stuff. They have to learn about the visual patterns characteristic of objects at different scales of space and time. So here are some fakes produced by adversarial generative methods. And as you can see, they're pretty good, apart from maybe the two-headed horse and you know, things like that, and the fact that everything's a little bit curvier than you might expect it to be. So there's a lot that these things don't know, but they're still not bad jobs. Um, these are fake celebrities produced using generative imaging techniques. There'll be a, a lot that we can say about you know, the differences between these generative models and generative models as they figure in hierarchical predictive coding. But the generativity is the same. So crucially, in hierarchical predictive coding, the generation engine is what you use for online perception. The brain tries to recognize what's in the scene by building it for itself using what it knows about the world. So I recognize this scene by building it using what I know about the world. I know about lectures, I know about people, I know about jumpers. Put all that stuff together, jumpers, sweaters. I don't know what the American is, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the goal is for a cascade of this sort of construction to match, and as some people sometimes say, explain away the incoming sensory signal. There's a danger in this talk of explaining away, because what gets explained away in these stories is actually prediction error, not the representation. So be careful of that. Okay. So maybe, this is why I like it philosophically, maybe this is how a structured world comes into view in perception. And not just a structured world, but a world we understand. We build our percepts out of everything that we know about the world. No wonder to perceive the world in that sort of way is to be engaged with it as a kind of understanding agent. So there's no limit on what kinds of information you can use to do the construction. The kind of simple systems that I was looking at earlier, like fake celebrities and that, they're basically not looking beyond kind of pixel-level correlations, uh, even though they're using multi-level systems. But you can use all kinds of information. There's no limit on what you could use. You could use information about your own interoceptive state, information about how things will typically unfold at multiple timescales in the future, and so on. OK, so you can go beyond patterns in pixel space. Indeed, you know, we can use stuff about how looks predict tastes, about how stuff unfolds in time, and about how my own actions will alter what I perceive. So although we're not going to talk, I'm not going to talk about action today, because I thought we were just doing hierarchical predictive coding for perception, so I mean, we're not going to do action, um, but you know, one of the thoughts might be that um, in action what we do is we minimize prediction error by changing the world to fit the prediction. Um, that's a sort of typical way of bringing the two under the same umbrella. So that's a bit that I certainly believe that generative models play a big role in perception and that they explain a lot. And here's a bit that I think is up for grabs, predictive coding. So predictive coding is a very particular story about the way that the generative model might be used to engage the sensory input. So a very specific story, which is, I think, in the end, a good thing. The idea is that moment by moment, 
All the brain needs to bother about is whatever escaped that attempt at multi-level prediction. So you bring your multi-level prediction engine to bear, you do the best that you can. Anything that escapes prediction um, is, if you like, the newsworthy sensory information. So stuff that the brain ought to be caring about as it uh, sorry, goes on. Yeah. Prediction error carries the news. OK. I don't know what that is at the bottom. Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, something I should have fixed there. Calculated at every level fixed. Yeah, I didn't fix that. <laughs> OK. Um, so prediction errors are a sort of anti-hero in these stories. They're used to select better top-down guesses, refining the flow of prediction. But if you don't succeed at predicting, then they drive enough plasticity to install a better generative model. So failures of prediction will actually cause the generative model to improve. OK, so to make all that work, formal models here depict distinct prediction, sometimes called representation, units and error units at every level of neuronal processing. So that's a, an important part of the formal story here. The idea is that there are distinct units, in a very broad sense of units, for predictions and for prediction errors. They've been associated in implementation stories with deep pyramidal cells, the source of backward connections in the brain, as doing predictions, and superficial pyramidal cells, the source of forward connections, as carrying prediction errors. So that's a particular implementation proposal about the formal story. Um, there's also some, um, this is also tied up with spectral asymmetry stuff, with the idea that the, uh, the typical sort of spectral profiles of the superficial pyramidal cells uh, are kind of are carrying um, error, and the profiles of the deep cells are carrying prediction. Indeed, there they are. Beta band frequencies associated with predictions and gamma band with prediction errors. And some interesting evidence for that seems to be emerging too. So that gives you sort of um, multi-time scale communication amongst uh, of predictions and prediction errors. So what's strictly required for hierarchical predictive coding? I think what's strictly required is just that the brain displays a deep functional asymmetry between something that carries predictions and something that carries precision-weighted prediction errors. I've not said anything yet about precision weighting, but I will in a minute. And that those two somethings combine according to the predictive coding formula. That, I think, is all you actually need. I think anything that satisfies that is a hierarchical predictive coding story. So I think that actually uh, David Heger's story is a hierarchical predictive coding story, even though I'm sure he's going to say it isn't. Um, OK. <laughs> so predictive coding is efficient. Using only predictive signal elements to drive further processing saves you doing anything else apart from changing what you're doing according to unpredicted signal elements. Turns out there's something pushing back against that, which is the precision weighting stuff, which I'll come to in a minute. So this is a bit like commercial linear predictive coding, where you know, if you're communicating motion compressed video, you only need to communicate what changed from frame to frame because you can assume all the other stuff is similar. So you get the same sort of save in there. So predictive coding here implies a perfectly predicted signal would drive or recruit no further processing. And people have been worried about this, as if there's a kind of threat that maybe, maybe you're going to put the brain out or something. I don't know, as if you, know, if you get good at predicting it, then the lights are just going to go out, the world will fade away. Um, but you know, that's not going to happen. Um, it doesn't mean that the well-predicted world fades from view. What it means is that no new representation unit activity is going to get recruited. So remember, the idea here is at every level of processing, you've got prediction error units and representation units. The job of the prediction error units is basically to get the right representation units active at every level at the right time. So existing representation unit activity should be preserved as long as the task that you're performing demands it or until some preset decay period um, expires. And in fact, you know, that's pretty obvious, really, because if that wasn't the case, there'd be nothing to continue suppressing the errors at the level below. It's only representations up here that get to suppress level um, errors down here in the standard implementation. So if the representation units went out, then um, there would be nothing suppressing the errors, and they'd come back. But that's not going to happen. Okay. So lastly, um, this story isn't just about the suppression of error. It's also about the enhancement of the important. And this, I think, is the, the, the thing that it's easy to miss in some of these stories, particularly if maybe you base your understanding of them on Rao and Ballard. Um, so the idea here is that the suppression of select errors will obviously sharpen some representations. So 
um, prediction error units and error units, uh, sorry, and representation units at a given level are linked together. So suppressing certain errors will enhance some representations already. But there's another mechanism here as well, which is that prediction errors get weighted according to their estimated reliability, importance, inverse variance, basically sometimes called precision. So the idea here is that some prediction errors will count for more than others. So um, according to the task that I'm trying to perform, my brain should be able to estimate what prediction errors are most relevant for that task and kind of amplify the effects of these errors so that um, they're, if you like, artificially forced to drive more processing than they would otherwise. So the very same amplitude error actually gets uh, increased in its postsynaptic effects. Yeah, there. Ooh. So what that means is that these frameworks display not just suppression of what's well predicted, but also enhancement of what's important. And I think that, uh, that we do need to keep that in mind. There's some nice um, multivariate pattern analysis stuff that shows exactly that sort of duplex pattern. And as far as implementation goes, um, dopamine and other neurotransmitter economies are thought to be doing a lot of the precision modulation. Um, okay. So. The crucial thing in all this, the thing that I think is the hot molten core of hierarchical predictive code, so we've had the beating heart earlier, now we've got the hot molten core, is that predictions do all the heavy lifting in perception. So the idea is that there's a, a deep asymmetry in the kind of looms of, the, of neural weave, if you like. Um, prediction errors are excitatory, driving them fast. The flow of prediction is inhibitory, nonlinear, and slow. So predictions get together in very interesting ways. Prediction errors, they just errors relative to those predictions, and they get together in very boring ways. So all the work of building the percept, if these stories are right, is done by the predictive cascade. Incoming sensory information, as I was trying to say earlier, just provides a sort of corrective feedback. Two minutes, okay, on this co-constructed process, this isn't Ma, nor is it just biased competition. Um, Maybe it's controlled hallucination, but we said that, so let's move further, faster, harder. Um, <laughs> it's an approximation of Bayesian inference, okay. Perception and understanding are inseparable, kind of said that already. Perception and imagination are co-emergent, we've said that. Um, perception, memory and imagination, worth pausing to say this, are variant uses of a single machinery. And the core there is a distributed generative model. So that, I think, is important, hadn't quite said that yet. Um, clinical applications, oh, we're going to have to skip those. No, so anyway, you can think about autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, and other things in those terms. Um, idea might be that you've got an imbalance between sensory prediction error and knowledge in the generative model, so the incoming sensory information seems constantly challenging and puzzling, hard to press it down with your generative model. This is the summary that I'm going to end on, summary of defining features. Perception crucially involves a distributed probabilistic generative model. Precision-weighted prediction error is actively computed during every episode of processing. There's a fundamental asymmetry in neural wiring here, so that predictive flow is doing all the heavy nonlinear lifting. That asymmetry is exploited by combining predictions and error signals using the predictive coding formula. Precision weighting nuances and combats that, that suppressive effect. It kind of reverses it, although Carl doesn't like me to say that. Okay. Right. Um, last point. Reflection on those core futures, I think, um, shows us that we shouldn't take evidence for generative model-based effects alone as evidence for HPC. HPC is making very specific claims about how the generative model might be used. And similarly, as Michael Rescola has noted, evidence for generic Bayesian profiles alone is even less good as evidence for HPC. Um, reasons to be cheerful, good evidence for all the core features. Lucia is going to talk about that. That evidence, I think, actually supports not just the formal core, time is up, the implementation story too, um, this is the end, this is the end, a note of caution, we're going to have to compare with conceptual and formal near neighbours um, before we uh, can do the proper Bayesian model comparison, dogs from Sussex, that's it. <laughs> okay, David Heger is next. Switching computers, just a minute.
back there. Okay, it's time for you now all to do some controlled hallucination <laughs> of the slides that are here on my laptop. What do you want me to do? Here, I'm going to unplug this and plug it back in again. Maybe that'll work. There we go. Okay. Um, so we agree about many things. We're, I think we're going to sort of disagree about some things. That, that I want to make a couple points. One is that there are three different, I think, conceptually distinct uh, ideas that are being tossed together uh, here. One of them is about prediction, per se, and by that I mean prediction over time. One of them is about coding and efficiency. And one of them is about inference. Okay? And I, and I want to try to tease those things apart um, uh, and, uh, and, and actually go back in time a little bit to where some of these uh, ideas come from. So first, predictive coding as it was originally uh, used and efficient transmission starts in the 1950s um, with basically data compression. Um, what is now in the form of the way that video images come over your uh, Fios network uh, so that you can stream video um, on your TV at home or over the cell network uh, to stream video on your, on your uh, cell phone. Um, and so here's an example of what one of those systems looks like, just to be clear about how it works. Um, so you have a current frame of video that you want to send over a wire. Um, the images are big and take up a lot of space and will transmit very slowly and inefficiently. But you know that there's not a whole lot that changes from one instant to the next in an image. There's a lot of redundancy. Um, so engineers can take advantage of that redundancy and brains might take advantage of that redundancy in order to be more efficient about how information is transmitted. Um, so in particular, you have uh, previous images from the video. Um, you can compare that with the current one, figure out which stuff has changed, use that to figure out what's the additional stuff you need to send, um, send only that additional stuff and code it very efficiently, maybe code information about the difference, that's what goes over your Verizon wire, and then you decode it on the other end with the purpose of reconstructing as well as you can what that original uh, image was. Now, you can be a little bit fancier about this because the encoder can afford to be, uh, have, do more computation, and it can run a little simulation of what the decoder is going to do, and instead of sending this in here, it can send the decoded version of the motion. It can send the decoded version of the residual image in order to figure out what to transmit so that the decoder can do the best job it can do. This is all about coding efficiency. It's all about efficient transmission of information. Um, there's no processing. The idea here is to reconstruct as well as you can the image that you would have had. Now, what relevance might this have to the brain? Well, a lot. Um, so, for example, if you look at the retina, which is this thin layer of neural tissue at the back of your eye, it consists of a bunch of different types of neurons, notably, that are connected in intricate circuits, uh, notably two types that I'll mention here. One is the photoreceptors. They're responsible for taking light and turning it into electrical signals. And the other ones are called the retinal ganglion cells, um, whose axons make up the fibers of the optic nerve and transmit those signals off to your brain. Now, you have about 100 million photoreceptors in each eye, but only about half a million uh, retinal ganglion cells, okay? Um, if you had 100 million uh, uh, fibers in your optic nerve, your optic nerve would be like bigger than your head, and that would be a problem, okay? So there ha there's an issue of efficiency here. Here's another example. The way that neurons transmit information over long distances by means of action potentials, these brief little pulses of electrical activity that travel uh, along the nerve fibers, um, and, uh, and, and, and they cost a lot of energy. Um, and so the information that, that a neuron is computing needs to be coded in some way. In fact, the information that a population of neurons is, is computing in a particular little chunk of brain needs to be coded in some way so that that information can just get transmitted uh, to another part of the brain. Okay? Um, and this requires a lot of metabolic demand. Your brain uses like 20% of your total body's energy, um, which means that it can only support about a tenth 
uh, of an actual potential per, per spike per neuron. So it's reasonable to hypothesize that the brain uses predictive coding, like MPEG video coding strategies, along with other things to optimize the efficiency of transmission. And this is an idea that was brought into the field of neuroscience by this paper, um, uh, in which they argued very specifically that particular computations that are done in the retina are do part of the job of making it possible to transmit information efficiently from the light, the photoreceptors, um, to, to, the, to, the, to, to, to a more efficient code uh, that can, can get shipped out along the, the optic nerve, the axons of the retinal ganglion cells. Okay? Uh, but as with video coding, this is about efficient transmission. Okay? Um, and the idea is that those signals could effectively get decoded or reconstructed at the other end where further processing is done. All right. How about predictive processing and perceptual inference? So the brain needs to make predictions, um, uh, if nothing else, to compensate for temporal delays. Um, so it takes several hundred milliseconds between when, in, when light hits your eye and your sensory systems can process it and you can plan a motor act and make a movement to, to respond to that. Um, so Serena here is about to hit this tennis ball, um, but in fact, all of the effort of her sensory systems and motor planning and motor execution happened way back here when the tennis ball was, was uh, at a different position, essentially guessing forward in time where the ball's going to be at some later point in time. Now, there's some debate in the uh, neuroscience literature about whether that, um, that, uh, that kind of jump ahead in time, that prediction in time, is really a sensory processing thing or whether the sensory processing always lives in the past um, and the motor control uh, is jumping forward in time. Uh, but I think we can make a reasonable argument uh, that the sensory processing has to be predicting forward in time as well. And here's a little demo uh, from an experiment that, um, that we did in my lab with uh, Uri Hassan a number of years ago. Um, so I'm going to show you a silent movie um, played backwards. Okay, it's an excerpt from the Charlie Chaplin movie, uh, and I want you to try and figure out what's going on in the movie. Okay, um, so here we go. Short little clip. Okay, now remember what you, what you constructed as the narrative for that clip, and now you're going to see it forward. Same clip now played forward. Okay, so the laughs already give it away. How many of you had the correct interpretation after watching the backward movie? How many of you came up with, with an incorrect interpretation that, okay. So, you know, many of you had the incorrect interpretation from the, from the studies that we did. Many of you actually had different incorrect interpretations uh, of the backward movie. Um, so running time forward is important for how your sensory systems work, even when there's no actual active motor control involved. And in fact, what we found is that different areas of the brain process information at different time scales, which we think has to do with predicting forward uh, in time uh, over different time scales. Okay, so that's what I mean by predictive processing. It inherently has to do with time. The third concept is perceptual inference. I'm sure that many of you know this image. If there's anybody who, doesn't already, who hasn't already seen this image, you probably can't tell what it is until I tell you that this is a Dalmatian. There's its head. It's, uh, it's sniffing the ground under the sort of a shade of a tree over here, front legs. There's the hind part of it back across here, right? OK. So um, now, that you've been, now that it's been explained to you what that image is, or if you've seen it before, you recognize that it and know what it is, for the rest of your life, any time this image comes up on a screen, you will recognize it instantly um, as this Dalmatian sniffing the ground under a tree. So you have some prior expectation for what this image is, because you remember seeing something like it before. Um, and that prior expectation is being fed top down in combination with the bottom up sensory information, which is just these little black and white spots, uh, to, to help you perceptually organize that incoming sensory image. 
Okay, uh, and this is what Andy was referring to um, as you know something like a Bayesian process. You can think of this top-down thing as sort of a generative model or prior, which which is being combined with sensory information, which is kind of like a likelihood, and you're putting together the best interpretation of the sensory information um, given uh, given that um, that prior or, or generative idea. In fact, you can take it even further. Um, right now, you can literally just imagine the image that you just saw. Um, and when people do this kind of task, um, what you see is activity in sensory areas of the brain that looks very similar to uh, what you would measure uh, if there was an actual image being presented at that time. So there is this kind of, I completely agree that there's some kind of a generative process um, that, that is in some ways analogous to Bayesian inference and is in some ways analogous um, to these general adversarial models, the examples of which um, uh, Andy showed you that, that generate images. Okay. Um, but it seems to me that you want to have a knob there. There are some times when sensory systems act primarily as a bottom-up, fast, throughput um, uh, sensory processing system. There are other times when the knob gets turned all the way the other direction, and it's entirely generative, like imagine the image of the Dalmatian under the tree. And there are other times when the knob is set somewhere in between, in which you're combining generative top-down or prior information with sensory bottom-up. Um, likelihood information. Okay, now how might that work? Um, well, so we have Jan LeCun in the front row here. Um, so, so this is what he's famous for. Um, uh, the, these uh, convolutional deep neural nets, um, which you've all heard about. And, uh, and I will not explain in any detail except to say um, that you feed it an image, you do some processing, uh, you feed that forward, you do some more processing, you feed that forward, and you keep repeating that. The processing at each stage is very simple. It's literally a convolution and a threshold and a rectification. And out the other end comes a bunch of numbers. Um, and if the numbers, um, a vector of numbers, have a particular pattern, then you classify it as being an object of one type. And if it has a different, different pattern, you, have, you, you, you classify it as being an object of a different type. This feed forward thing won't do this job of combining the top-down prior information with the bottom-up, okay? Um, but there are some tricks that you can do, uh, even on top of this architecture, to do stuff that's kind of like that. And this is the Google Dreams, or the, uh, which Andy also showed examples of. So the idea here is you take this as the input image, but you also force upon it at the same time what you want the output to be. So you want this to be of the class of, I don't know what those things are even, dogs or something. Are these dogs or these sheep, whatever. So you say, here's my input image, but I want top down for it to be classified as dog. So find me the best in image such that it's as close as possible to where I started from, but it also gives me the output, um, the output out here that I want. Okay? Um, I, and and there simple technical ways that you can do that. Um, uh, one way is with, a, with Andy mentioned, a generative model, uh, a, a, ge a generalized adversarial uh, network. That actually has two different networks, one of which does the bottom-up sensory thing and the other one of which does the top-down generative thing. You can also do it, in principle, with one network of neurons in which you have this knob that you turn. Um, that controls how much of it is bottom-up driven and how much of it is top-down driven or how to combine it. And, um, and he was referring to this paper, so I'll put it up here, and he was, uh, published last year in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which is one idea for how you do that. It combines feed-forward bottom-up drive with top-down feedback drive with recurrent processing over time to do all of these things at once. Um, so it can behave like a deep net that does bottom-up sensory processing, like a generative model that does something like memory recall or visual imagery, combining the two to do inference and also to do prediction over time. Um, and here comes the really important part that you all must pay close attention to and understand. Um, you can write it down in a system of <laughs> equations, which you can implement, uh, and, uh, and, and you can get it to work. I'm not going to do the Charlie Chaplin thing, but here's a simpler example in which there's a simple moving visual stimulus that's moving back and forth here. If we just think about a single line through this, that's x position time goes back and forth. Uh, and this thing um, can, by doing this, in fact, hierarchical with different time scales, 
recurrent processing with feed forward and feedback stuff ge uh, generate a prediction for what's going to happen in the future. Okay? All right, summary. Predictive processing and predictive coding are two different things. Predictive coding is one of various strategies for achieving greater efficiency. It entails explaining away. Um, it's about efficient transmission after with the which the signals get decoded or reconstructed. And it does not necessarily entail predictive processing over time. In fact, most of the so-called predictive coding models have nothing to say about time at all. Uh, most of them are about kind of top-down uh, generative processing or, or priors in a Bayesian sense combined with bottom-up sensory processing uh, and don't entail uh, prediction over time. What I'm calling predictive processing is about compensating for processing delays and supporting perceptual inference. It doesn't necessarily entail, uh, entail predictive coding or explaining away. In fact, my version of it has neither of those. Um, uh, and it can support generative processing like memory recall uh, by avoiding the explaining away. You generate um, a, a, a top-down image. Last slide. So my answer to the question, does hierarchical predictive coding explain perception, is the answer is no. Um, that, in fact, predictive processing is critical for perception and perceptual inference, uh, and that predictive coding contributes to efficient signal transmission. We have reason to believe that both of these things go on in the brain. Um, it, it, is, it is worthwhile and interesting to think about how to put them together, but it's also worthwhile and interesting to think conceptually about the different roles that they play uh, and to study each of them uh, on their own. That's that. So Lucia Maloney is next. All right. So what I want to do now to focus more or less the the debate, or why we can shoot into any direction, is to start by saying, like, I think that most here agree that the brain is Bayesian in some sense, in the sense that, you know, if you look at this image, I hope that you can see a brain. If you can't, well, maybe, you know, we have to do something. But, you know, most people actually would actually see their one. Um, so in a way, we all agree that there is priors that are combined with sensory evidence. So therefore, that's not the part that we really want to talk about today. What I want to talk today is this particular form of predictive coding, which is hierarchical predictive coding a la Friston. And I think that this is probably a good way to start because this, this will definitely speak, again, speak for what, speak yeah, sure, speak for what um, David was saying. So in, predictive co in, in hierarchical predictive coding a la Friston, the three processes that he was describing are mixed up. Right? So then, therefore, what we have to explain is actually much, much more difficult. And not only that, also the three different MAR levels are mixed up. So hierarchical predictive coding has an algorithmic level, a computational level, and also an implementational level, right? So therefore, the evidence for that is it's even more, is even stronger, right? Um, what does uh, hierarchical predictive coding minimally entail? That, okay, we have sensory input, and that this always has to be backward uh, or predictions that are conveyed by um, uh, backward connections, and the prediction errors should actually flow forward. Right. And they always, and as Andy was mentioning, that the, the predictive coding formula is that it has to be suppressed. So therefore, if there is no errors, then what is transmitted is almost no prediction error. And this is, this is hierarchical in the sense that every sensory area does the same computation in a way. So it's, it's, it's a canonical thing that repeats over and over and over. Um, and I want to start where um, Andy left it off. Um, so he presented four core arguments. And I want to actually focus the discussion here so then we can actually have something to talk about. Um, so he said that in the, in the version of Friston, uh, precision-weighted prediction errors are actively, actively computed, that there is a fundamental asymmetry in the wiring where top-down predictions flow down and uh, prediction errors flow up, um, that it's always combined by the predictive uh, coding formula, so in this case they are, um, it, it, it's a subtraction, and the attention nuance this effect. But uh, you know, what always nagged me about this thing is like, how much evidence do we really have for this? And the problem, you know, until recently, I would say that most of the evidence came from things that I think it's hard to convince physiologists, which is fMRI or EEG, you know, non-invasive measures that is actually hard to you know, really sell when you, know, when you say that, well, there should be an, a prediction error unit like a neuron and a prediction error unit like a neuron as well. So what I will try to do in these 15 minutes is to provide you the evidence that we have so far from the last two years 
um, actually from yeah exactly from the last two years in terms of you know what what is the evidence for uh, prediction for prediction errors and for and for pre and for predictions at the single level at the single unit level at the cortical layers and also in humans right. Um, so let me start with one of my favorite papers. Um, this is from the group of uh, um, Georg Keller. He has plenty, so I just pick up one because I think this is the, the nicest. So what he did is that he puts um, rats in this case. Oh, sorry. He puts rats. Oops. Uh oh. Now this, you know, here this pointer to all this weird stuff. Yeah. Um, so he puts the rats in. Um, in a virtual tunnel, and the, what is interesting here is that he actually made the rats to, to just navigate it, right? And at different points, the rats would actually see different patterns. So in this case, the A pattern is a couple oriented to the left, the B is a couple oriented to the, sorry, uh, the other way around. Uh, the A pattern is a couple oriented to the, to the right, the B is a couple oriented to the left, and so on and so forth. And the rats, the only thing they had to do is to just traverse and traverse, you know, like this, uh, this tunnel. What he did very nicely is that he actually collected two photon imaging. So he could actually imagine the neurons as the rat was learning this, uh, this, uh, um, this, uh, this tunnel. And what he observed is the following. So there, over time, there, was, there were neurons that would, re would, re would respond in anticipation to the stimulus. So these are the prediction neurons. And the ones that would actually respond with causal delay. Those, let's say from now, that those are the prediction error neurons. What is even more interesting is that these neurons actually contain information. So he could decode before the, the image was going, was going to present whether this was going to be an A pattern or a B pattern. Even more so, it could decode it with confidence. What does this mean? So the rats could actually have 100% confidence that that pattern would, would, would be presented, and the responses in terms of amplitude would be much higher than if they had only 90% of confidence. So they would scale up with how much the, rat, the, the mice, in this case, would predict that the image is going gonna, is gonna to happen. More beautiful. So what he did then was like, OK, let's take the neurons that you know, is gonna, are going to, uh, for instance, take the B pattern. right? And then he asked, OK, let's just sort them out by how much the prediction was before. And the idea of the prediction of the predictive coding is that the better your prediction, the smaller your prediction error should be. And the, and the worse your prediction, the better, the worse, uh, the, in this case, the higher the prediction error should actually be. And this is exactly what he found here. So if there was a lot of activity in the prediction neurons before, the responses after the stimulus were actually much smaller than, than if, they, if there was almost no prediction. But this was only if the pattern was expected. Now, what would you expect if the pattern was a mismatch? So in this case, it's the opposite, right? So in this case, now, the neurons would respond much more if the pattern was the mismatch, right? So in this case, what we have, and I think is very interesting, so on the one hand, oops, I'm really sorry, guys. I don't know what this pointer is doing. Um, so what these neurons were doing, on the one hand, is, co is coding for predictions, also for prediction errors, but also for the confidence of those priors, right? Um, what is the evidence that we have for prediction errors in humans? And in this case, what we run is a study where we present the different patterns, acoustic patterns to subjects. So in this case, something like la la, la la, and then sometimes you know, we would actually change you know, la lu, something like that. So in, in a way, you would actually have a repetition that was either expected or not expected. And now what is interesting in this case is that any other model that would expect that would, for instance, predict adaptation would say, well, there, there, should be some, there should be nothing interesting in this case because the two patterns are indistinguishable. The only difference is that in one case, one of the patterns was predicted and the other, in the other case was not. And what we observed was a very strong response in this case in all these areas. This is ECOG, so these are electrodes that are implanted in people's brain. And what you observe here is that the, all these areas res have a stronger response to the unpredicted pattern as compared to the predicted pattern. And what is important is that it's the same pattern. So there's no difference physically. It's only what the subjects had expected. Um, OK, so I hope that at least I show you that there is evidence for something like prediction units, something like prediction error units. But there is also something that the predictive coding uh, um, hypothesis puts forward, which is that the hypothesis should come from a higher area. So what is the evidence that we have for that? There's one beautiful paper by Kaspar Svetsik. What they did is that they took um, the face, the face patch system. What is interesting about this face, face patch system is that it's three areas. So it's, a, it's a bunch of areas, but let's say in this case, let's take three, right? Where over three different um, 
uh, nodes, the image are, on the one hand, first of all, except that the, the monkeys have a very geospecific uh, response, then it has, it, it has mirror symmetry. This means that, you know, like every, it doesn't matter if you look to the left or to the right, the neurons will respond the same. And if you actually go to the front, then it doesn't matter, you know, in which direction you look. The only thing those neurons care is about the identity. So over this hierarchy, the neurons start coding less for the orientation, for in which, you know, view you are, but more for who you are, right? And what they did was something very clever. They just trained the, man the monkeys to, pass to passively see these images, right? And then they ask, okay, so let's assume and I present the pair that was trained. So in this case, this phase predicted that phase. What happened if I now rotate it? For, for you, did you, you would say, well, this is the same guy. So it doesn't matter, it's the same, it's the same pattern, right? So then therefore your prediction error should, also, should almost be zero, right? If I show you somebody else, you would say, well, this is not actually the pair that I was shown before, right? <laughs> the point is that they were actually recording from an area which is in this case ML. It's an area that in essence, it only responds to one particular orientation. So in this case, it should only care about the view that it had before. So what did they observe? They observed, first of all, that there is prediction errors. So in this case, what is important for you to note is that it's the same image that they are, that they are contrasting. There is no differences in this case. The only thing is the history. So what did the monkey said before, right? And what they found now is that if for the pairs that were, that were um, excuse me, for the pairs that were trained, there's much less response than for the ones that were not trained. What is even more important is that it, this is only for, it's only so for the ones that are very, se very selective. So it's not any neuron. Only those that are very selective for the, for the specific image, they will have this response. And this is probably the, the most interesting bit. So what they found out is that over time, these neurons would actually stop responding. So at the very beginning, they had this very strong prediction error, but over time, this would actually go away. And it would go away in a very specific way. So only the views prediction error would go away, but the identity prediction errors would actually stay there. And this, this makes sense, right? So if you, look, if you look at me this way, or you look at me that way, it doesn't matter. But if you look at somebody else, it does matter, right? So that's exactly what these neurons, what these neurons do. Um, they generalize over views, but not over identities. And this is what you can see here. So over time, these are the view prediction errors, they went away, consistent with the idea they were explained away from areas above. In which, way, in which way they went away? And this, I think, is the most interesting bit of the evidence. Um, so as I told you before, there's something very neat about this hierarchy. They are recording in this area where the orientation actually matters. But in the area above, these two, the two views get lumped together. So therefore, if these neurons actually learn a pattern like this, you know, so they, these two get lumped together, now if you present a symmetric image, they should have very small prediction errors. If you show a frontal view, which, is, which wasn't paired, they should have a very strong prediction error. And that's exactly what they found, right? So in, in a way that this is a way to show that it's just coming from the area above. And what is more important here is that this area now is inheriting a, a, a way of coding that this area in, intrinsically does not have. So I think this is something really important for you to notice. Okay. Um, the next bit of evidence is from the, the lab of Jim DiCarlo. What they did is that they, again, they took the face pad system, as you see, like it's an interesting <laughs> system to work with, and they presented either images of faces or, or images that actually did not comply with, uh, comply with faces. And the only thing they did was now asking, like, how would the neurons respond over time? And the idea is that in hierarchical predictive coding, you explain away the, uh, the errors as time goes by. Right? So in, in a way that if the area above starts saying like, oh, this is a phase, this is a phase, this is a phase, the area below should say, okay, don't stop caring. You know, so the, in, a, in a way it should actually start, okay, it, it should start coding for something different. And they, 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 there is two different models you know, for this. So on the one hand, you can think of a model where there, there is only coding for phases or a, prediction, a predictive coding model where the responses or the selectivity would actually go down. Whereas in the areas above, of course, the selectivity should stay up. What did they find? That as, as you go through the hierarchy, the areas below, they stop coding for faces, which means that they actually have less prediction error, so to speak, right? Whereas the areas above, they keep, they keep actually signaling that there's a face there, right? Um, what they did then, I think this is an interesting uh, part, is they look at different, um, at different models that could explain these results, which are actually a little bit puzzling, so you wouldn't expect um, to, have, uh, uh, to have these responses where an area that is intrinsically coding for phases, then suddenly it's not coding for a phase. 
And what they observed in this case was that neither a feedforward model, which leads to these kind of responses, nor a lateral inhibition model, nor a normalization model, at least in the nonlinear form, would actually anyway resemble the response that they, rec that they record. Only, only a model, by the way, which is important, with feedback and errors being conveyed up to the hierarchy. So just having feedback is not sufficient. It has to be uh, um, also with errors. OK, and what is the last, the last bit of evidence uh, that I want to have, that I want to present you is, um, so what is, how much do we know about where prediction errors actually are? And what we did in this case was we looked for prediction errors in humans. We presented a pattern which is something like AAAB, so there is something unexpected. We mapped the areas that actually have prediction errors, you know, through ECOG, in this case, uh, recordings in, in, in uh, people's brain, and then we implanted a laminar electrode. So in this case, we can actually go through the different layers. And what we observe in this case, much like what predictive coding would propose, is that the superficial, the superficial uh, um, areas are the ones that actually, the superficial layers, sorry, are the ones that code for prediction errors in this case. This is only over five subjects. It's reliable over them. This is a reliability map. And this is actually what we observe. So finally. Um, so I do agree that there's many unknowns for predictive coding, but I think there's at least some reasons to be optimistic. So, you know, two years ago, we didn't really have much evidence for these different types of neurons or these different types of responses. Now, at, this, at least I think we have some. Definitely it's not complete, but it's actually, you know, better than, you know, doing fMRI, I would say. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, reasons to be cautious. And the reasons to be cautious is that we need to determine what predictive coding is actually a neural motif, because this is another uh, uh, part of the equation. So this should repeat across different areas, across different, you know, like uh, uh, modalities and so on and so forth. And also, much like uh, Andy mentioned, we need to pit this against other models. You know, so it's not enough just to say, okay, it's not predictive coding. I mean, I think many theories actually make very similar claims. So the point now is, how are we going to get different predictions for, for all these theories? And I think that this is it. So thank you. I was on Next speaker is Michael Rescorla. Thank you very much, uh, Ned and David, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I'm supposed to be opposing hierarchical predictive coding, so I want to begin by saying I don't oppose hierarchical predictive coding at all. I think it's a great research program. Um, my issue is more with how these ideas are being received and promoted in the philosophical community. Um, I'm not convinced that it's as uh, well-established and as promising as Andy and as some other philosophers, such as Jakob F. Howey, have uh, suggested, um, especially when you compare it with a generic Bayesian viewpoint on perception. So let me begin with the generic Bayesian viewpoint. Um, the central question for perceptual psychology is how does the perceptual system transform proximal sensory stimulations such as retinal stimulations, into percepts, perceptual states that represent distal shapes, sizes, colors, locations, and so on. Uh, in the 19th century, Hermann von Helmholtz proposed that uh, the perceptual system executes what he called an unconscious inference um, uh, to form a best hypothesis as to the distal conditions that are causing its current sensory uh, stimulations. P Bayesian perceptual psychology takes this idea on board and treats the unconscious inference as an unconscious 
Bayesian inference. So the idea is that the perceptual system has prior probabilities, prior likelihoods. It receives sensory input. It executes a Bayesian inference, computes the posterior probability, and on that basis selects a privileged hypothesis as to distal conditions. This uh, research program has uh, amassed a large number of impressive explanatory achievements. Uh, it gives uh, satisfying explanations for a lot of perceptual illusions, such as motion illusions, um, perceptual constancies, such as color constancy, cue combination, how the uh, visual system combines distinct visual cues to, uh, say, depth, to form an integrated depth, depth percept. I'm just going to mention one paper out of the you know, hundreds of papers one could mention in this field, which is the paper Unifying Account of Visual Motion and Position Perception by Quan, Tidina, and Nil, which is a really nice paper because it's a, it's a Bayesian object tracking model, um, and they show how this model with, you fix the parameters for the model, it can then, for each indiv individual subject, explain a whole range of different motion illusions that are, arise for a bunch of different stimuli. So that this, this paper, along with many other papers in this field, illustrate that you have a kind of unifying explanatory power that comes from Bayesian modeling. It's not just an exercise in curve fitting because you have these simple models that really explain a whole range of, of data. Um, so overall, I think that the Bayesian paradigm has achieved great explanatory success and that it's our, our best current framework for understanding perception. Now, the question arises, of course, how the brain is implementing Bayesian inferences. And I think you know, everyone who's working on that question, and now there are lots and lots of people working on this, recognizes that we're not going to find that the brain uh, precisely implements Bayesian inferences. In general, uh, aside from some special cases, uh, it's not computationally tractable to compute the posterior from the priors. So in general, what we would expect to find rather is that the brain is approximately implementing these idealized Bayesian inferences. And there are a lot of resources from computer science and engineering that give a lot of ideas for how the brain might be doing this, might be approximately implementing idealized Bayesian inferences given by these Bayesian perceptual models. The predictive coding models that, that Andy talks about in his book, models especially the, the kind propounded by Carl Friston, uh, are one strand in this literature. So they're one set of ideas about how the brain might be doing this, might be approximately implementing Bayesian inference. Um, but they are just one strand. There are, as several people, have, the previous speakers have alluded to, there are several other ideas floating around about how this might happen. So for example, another idea that a lot of people are looking at is that um, the brain does a sort of sampling approximation. To, so you give up trying to compute the posterior. Instead, what you do is you draw samples from the hypothesis space. And you set up your sampling algorithm in such a way that the distribution of samples, as you keep repeatedly drawing samples, the distribution will approximately match the true posterior. So the, this activity of drawing samples can serve as an approximate proxy for uh, actually computing the posterior, which you can't do. And this sampling approximation is very successful in, in several fields, such as robotics. And a lot of people are looking now at applying them to uh, Bayesian inferences uh, approximated by the brain as well. So the first point I wanted to make about predictive coding is, is that, as, as Andy mentioned in his presentation as well, n nothing about Bayesian perceptual psychology per se mandates a predictive coding implementation. In general, these Bayesian models are captured at a very abstract level. They talk about you know, priors, prior likelihoods, posteriors. They don't get into any neural implementation details. So in particular, they, they, they don't presuppose that prediction error figures explicitly in computations uh, executed by the perceptual system or that the computational architecture has a hierarchical structure. They just re remain neutral about that kind of thing. Um, so how strong is the evidence for a predictive coding account of perception versus a generic Bayesian account of perception? Um, in my opinion, it's, it's a lot less strong. So uh, we talked some about some of the neurophysiological evidence. Um, but as Andy and Lucia both said, you know, really, we're at a preliminary stage of understanding these things. There's a lot of different ideas floating around. We need to really look at a lot of these other options that are on the table. A lot of these other models that are out there can also explain a lot of this neurophysiological evidence. Um, I want to focus, though, in my remarks more on the behavioral uh, side of the equation. 
One of the most impressive things about generic Bayesian perceptual psychology is that it's shown a consistent ability to generate detailed models of specific perceptual tasks. And these models, um, when you look at them, they, they match the data very nicely in a lot of cases. And they seem to give really satisfying explanations, such as that object tracking model that I mentioned earlier. So th this is a thriving research program. It's a research program which is continually demonstrating its ability to, to explain perception, as the title of this debate says. To, in other words, explain why perceptual states have the features that they have. Why, in certain circumstances, does, does, does the individual end up in a perceptual state with certain features? Bayesian models give a lot of insight into that. I'm not convinced that, so far, the predictive coding has that same track record of success, that same track record of, again and again, producing models that seem highly explanatory of, of perceptual states. First of all, there aren't nearly as many such dis discussions in the literature, not nearly so many attempts to give these detailed models of specific perce perceptual tasks. Uh, and second of all, the, when, you, when you look at the models, I think often they don't match the generic Bayesian models in terms of their explanatory success. Uh, I just wanted to focus the discussion to talk about one specific paper. Um, this is a paper by Howie Ropsdorf and Friston called Predictive Coding Explains Binocular Rivalry in Epistemological Review. And I, I didn't pick the paper at random. I picked it because it gets widely cited by proponents of predictive coding. So Andy cites it in his book, and uh, Jakob Howie cites it in, it, in his book. And both of them mentioned this, this as a, as a uh, illustration of the explanatory power of the predictive coding approach, um, sort of a poster child for here are the explanatory dividends that we uh, can gain from the predictive coding framework. And I'm not so convinced of that. Um, so the phenomenon at, at issue in this paper is binocular rivalry, in other words, where the two eyes receive conflicting images, like one eye gets a face image, the other gets a house image. And in general, in these kinds of situations, what happens is that you don't get a fusion or su superposition of the two. You don't get like a fused face house percept. You toggle back and forth. You see a face, then a house, a face, then a house. Um, and as the authors say, this makes sense um, on a predictive coding viewpoint. We have a low prior probability of a face house fused percept because, I mean, we know from experience faces and houses don't occupy the same place at the same time. So that pretty much leaves a face and a house as the best options available. But if you see it as a face, then there's this massive prediction error, because what about this house image you have in the other eye? That prediction error drives you to see it as a ha house, but now there's massive prediction error, because what about this face image in the other eye? And that generates this toggling back and forth. And so the paper contains a, a lot of discussion about how one would develop the, these ideas. But the paper doesn't contain um, a detailed model of binocular rivalry. It doesn't contain a model in, in the sense that Bayesian perceptual psychology typically offers models. There's no specification of a prior probability, li likelihood, posterior. Uh, there's no predictive coding algorithm given, given in the paper. The explanation is purely verbal. So there's no detailed quantitative model with quantitative testable predictions that you can then match up against the data. So then that's typically what one finds in these Bayesian um, papers, is you get a very detailed model, which you can you know, compare with, with the actual data and evaluate how good of an explanation is this. You don't find that in, in this paper. So for this reason, I don't think that the discussion in this paper does really match the explanatory success of generic Bayesian modeling. I would uh, compare this paper with another uh, paper on binocular rivalry by Gershman, Vohl, and Tenenbaum called Multistability and Perceptual Inference. And this paper takes a different approach. It treats binocular rivalry as resulting from a sampling approximation to idealized Bayesian inference. So. Um, Binocular rivalry also makes sense from a sampling viewpoint because in, in, in the binocular rivalry type situation, you're basically going to have a bimodal posterior. You're going to have high probability for, let's say, the face, high probability for the house. Um, and if you're sampling from the posterior, uh, you're sampling it in approximate accord with the posterior probability, then as you draw samples, you're going to sometimes be drawing the face, sometimes be drawing the, the house. And that's what's going to generate the toggling. It'll just arise between the two percepts. It'll arise naturally from the fact that you're constantly sampling. Um, so in this paper, there is a 
detailed model. And the model offers quantitative testable predictions. So in this, this paper, they give a precise specification of posterior probability. And then they give a precise sampling approximation algorithm. It approximates the computation of the computationally intractable task of computing that posterior probability. And then they, have a, they show that the, this, uh, on this sampling model, a number of features of binocular rivalry naturally fall, fall out of the um, sampling approximation algorithm. So um, this can explain a variety of phenomena surrounding binocular rivalry. Um, for example, the general form of the distribution of switching times between percepts, it falls out naturally. Another phenomenon called um, traveling waves, where sometimes the, one percept doesn't instantaneously displace another, but rather one, it sort of sweeps out a traveling wave where one percept replaces the other. And this is a natural consequence of this sampling uh, model, uh, along with detailed quantitative features of the sampling model. So in this paper, you do get what one typically expects to find from models in Bayesian perceptual psychology, which is a detailed understanding of why we perceive the world the way that we perceive it as being. Why do we enter into a perceptual state with these specific features? How, does the, how do these features of the perceptual state depend on its causal antecedents, depend on the, the stimulus, and depend on the psychological antecedents, such as the priors? You get a systematic modeling of that, and that's what Bayesian models typically provide, and you get it from, from this paper as well. So I think there is a contrast between these two papers in their explanatory force. Obviously, these are just two papers drawn from thousands of papers in this area. By themselves, they don't show much. But um, I do think that. Um, the, this contrast between these two papers is emblematic of how I see the explanatory achievements of uh, the predictive coding framework when it comes to explaining perception, explaining why we enter inter perceptual states with certain features. Um, so I would conclude by urging that the predictive coding is an intriguing conjecture about how Bayesian perceptual inference might be approximately implemented by the brain. Um, but it's premature to elevate prediction error minimization into an overriding principle for perception. And this by no means means that scientists should stop working on predictive coding or anything like that. They absolutely should keep working on it and all, all these other ideas that are being pursued. But, but as, ph as philosophers looking to the science to try to extract morals about how the mind works, um, I think it's important to keep in a sense of proportion about the relative achievements of these uh, different research paradigms. And I think that when you compare the generic Bayesian research paradigm uh, it's with the predictive coding paradigm, thus far the explanatory and confirmatory achievements of the Bayesian, generic Bayesian viewpoint dwarf those of the predictive coding viewpoint. Thanks very much. Well, I don't, I don't mind starting because I like this. The, I, I like Michael's conclusions here. I'm, I'm, yeah, let's I'm, keep them up. I'm, as the I'm, conclusion I'm, of the I'm, whole I'm, debate. I'm, I'm down with that. <laughs> um, so, but I, but I'm gonna. Uh, I guess I'll I'll just add to it, which is not, you know not only is the goal here to explain phenomenology, um, to fit data, but um, but also if you think you have a reasonable theory about how the brain does perception, then it kind of has to work. Um, and the best examples we have of that are actually the deep convolutional neural nets, um, which don't have explaining away. They do, uh, they, they also don't explain all aspects of perception. They do kind of the, maybe a reasonable starting point of a model of this kind of this fast uh, first pass through. Uh, of perception and classification um, before the whole feedback and prior and expectation thing kicks in. Um, so in my thinking, when I worked on that paper that was published last year, so, so my starting point was I don't want to throw that away. I want to be able to keep that. So I have this knob that you can turn all the way to one end, and then it behaves just like a deep convolutional neural net, exactly the same, no different. 
um, you turn the knob all the other way and it, and it behaves completely like a generative model. You turn it somewhere in between and it's, a, and it's an implementation of approximate uh, Bayesian inference. Um, so, um, I, I, so I mean, I, I, to me, one of the kind of the critical ideas in here is the extent to which um, it's sensible to think about explaining away as being a key property of of how brains work, um, and how an an artificial, you know, AI type system um, uh, might work. And I, I don't see the need for it. Um, uh, and, 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 I, and, and I see the advantage to leaving it aside um, so that your generative models actually generate rather than, I don't know what they would do, um, generate, what, what would they generate? They would generate the stuff that's not, that, the, that, that's not predicted. I don't know what it would do. What, what, what does a generative model do in the context of, a, of, of hierarchical predict, predictive coding? It, it generates a percept in the light of the given the, the sorry it generates a percept given the sensory information. Um, but then what's the, so there's a fully generated image going all the way back. Yes. Um, uh, and so then what's being pro propagated forward is um, is what just the prediction error on the on one implementation. What goes forward is the error. You could implement it the other way and have prediction. You could have prediction going in the other direction and representation going in the other direction. It would still be a predictive coding system. You know, that's just how you use the wiring loom. The mathematics wouldn't alter. Well, I mean, so again, I, 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 it bothers me a little bit to be imprecise about the use of terminology, because if, if you call everything a predictive coding model, then, then, then everything's a predictive coding model. So, no, no, so, no. so, so, so that so, wouldn't so, be everything. That would only be things that have the right asymmetry yes. between the role of prediction, the role of prediction error, where they get together in the right kind of way. It's just that you can flip the forward and backward connections. That's not a big deal. So, I mean, but you called my thing a predictive coding model, but it computes something quite different from what the Friston model computes. So I think it computes more or less it's the same thing. Um, well, the wiring is different, and the representation of what each unit outputs is different. So, um, Friston thinks it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but with regard, I think the, 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 the points are well taken that um, predictive coding a la Friston is one form, it's one implementation. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you were right in pointing that maybe in that paper the, the implementation is not really spelled out. I think that's not that that that's the kind of model that is not very useful. Um, where I do think that it's actually useful in the sense that it's, it's much more constrained in some other regards. Why? This was the point I was trying to make. It has, it actually speaks to the three levels of MAR, and I think that in that sense, it's much more easily to falsify because you know any of those levels, if it's not sufficient, then it's going to be over. And I think in that sense, I'd rather have a model that is over specified. So therefore, I can really go and test it, you know, like at the level of perception, at the level of the model, and at the level of the brain, and then it's actually going to be over, as opposed to models where I don't really know, you know, what the brain is actually doing. So in that sense, if it's just, I have to, I'm not, and I, I'm with you that, you know, we shouldn't, um, you know, like just forget about the other models. But as we have a myriad of models, not just some, mil millions, I mean, you pick two for binocular rivalry, there is hundreds of others, right? And that's exactly the problem. Is how do we arbitrate among those models? OK, we can do model comparisons. How often do we do? So in Sam, in that paper, he didn't really do much model comparison. So in a way, like, OK, he fit the data, fine. You know, like he could have fit it with any other model, as much as Friston could have fit it with any other model. So the, the ball is going to be, you know, at the end, we're going to arbitrate only if we compare across them, first of all. And second of all, I do think that it's a, um, an asset that this model is over-specified. So there's going to be much easier. Like, if we don't have prediction error units, it's going to be over. And I think in that sense, it's much well, easier to. Look, I mean, there's a lot of reason that the brain might compute prediction error. It's a learning signal. It's an arousal signal. Just finding prediction error signals doesn't actually validate it. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if there was evidence against the specific circuitry mm -hmm. um, in, 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 uh, that, that comes out of that one paper from the Friston group, um, that they would say, well, OK, but you can implement the same thing with a slightly different circuitry. So I'm also not convinced that any one, you know, knock down any one piece of the story and the whole thing goes away. Um, you know, so, so the implementation actually could be different to compute the same the same variables, the distinction again that I have is that there you know in my thing there's no explaining away, there's a negotiation 
between the feedforward signals and the feedback signals, um, you know, that, that can in fact just reinforce one another rather than, uh, rather than explain away. Um, so that seems to me to be different from the fundamental idea. I mean, where did the name come from? So, so Friston, following on uh, Ballard, Ballard and Rao, borrowed this term from engineering which the key concept in there is the is the it's in the example I showed of the motion compensation explaining away eliminating the stuff that you don't need to push down the wire and that that's the core idea that's in the name now if the now the model has moved beyond that so that explaining away doesn't need to be a part of it then it's really a bad and confusing no, nomenclature and it's lost it's lost the kind of the intellectual thread of connection to the it's literature still explaining which it came from. away it's explaining away the prediction error just not explaining the way the representation. So can I just ask a clarification? Because I had thought from, from reading your yeah. book that you thought it was important that the, that not just the mathematical form of the difference asymmetry between prediction mm. units and error units, but that the error units be, you know, they be lower down and setting stuff up and the prediction units be setting mm. stuff up. But it seems now you, if I'm understanding you correctly, you don't I think, think it's that, important. you think, well, it could be, as long as there's a difference between them, it doesn't matter. I think really it's important that there's this flow of inf influence from higher levels to lower levels. It's just that you could, you could swap the use of superficial and deep pyramidal neurons and, and use that wiring in a different way, but there'd still be the flow of inference um, and influence from higher to lower. That's, I think that is an essential part of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, take that away. But, but Andy, we, we, way, we, we've known, we, there, we've known a... forever that there are feedback connections yeah, in the brain, yeah. that every exactly. feed-forward connection has a corresponding feedback yeah. connection from between yeah. any pair of brain areas. So we know that there are feedback signals and we know that they influence right. the processing. So what are you saying beyond that? But we didn't know that they were playing asymmetric roles. They could have been playing very symmetrical roles. We didn't know that there were distinct prediction error and prediction units. Those seem to me like they're, you know, that's saying a bit more than there's recurrent connectivity in the brain. That's consistent with just a, a general dynamical system story. And in uh, fact, you know, like I, I, you know, like at least that's why I brought up the evidence from the DiCarlo lab because they, they, for instance, they, they specifically tested for a feedback model as opposed to a feedback model transmitting prediction errors. And the feedback model did not explain the evidence the same way. And, and it wouldn't for obvious reasons, right? Because if you actually you know, multiply the prediction with the, with, the, with the sensory evidence, you would actually enhance the, the activity, which is what they did not observe. So the activity went down. So that's why they needed, for that particular model, and I'm not saying, I mean, this is just one piece of evidence out of many, but you know, so it seems that for some stuff, it, it seems to be doing relevant things. No, I like that. That's an interesting data set. I, I thought, though, with that paper, the way that they carved it up in that paper was that they, they, they what they call the predictive coding model, they said was disconfirmed, and that they, they no. say the error, the back propagation. I thought figure seven of that paper, where they have, you know, the whole demarcation. They... Okay, we're going to open it up to the audience. Let's exchange one of so, so no, it's it actually a debate. <laughs> okay. That wasn't my memory of it, but I'll have to look at it again. And what was the upshot of it? So, well, you can. No, you can. So, the, so they, they, they did billions of model comparisons because, of course, you know, like the way in which you can explain that, I mean, it's, it, they, they play with different toy models, right? right. And they, they look for one where the, um, where the responses would actually be enhanced because of, you know, feedback, or the response would, would be suppressed in light with the prediction error. And the only one, I mean, if you look at the graph that they have, it's very hard to explain in a different way, just because what they have is the, the neurons become less selective. It's, it's not that they become more selective, which would be consistent with actually you know, having a stronger posterior. They become less selective, right? So it's a hard to, it's a hard to explain uh, data, and it's actually very counterintuitive with what we think that the face patch system is actually doing. Right, so this is not like if we think about convolutional neural networks. This is not what we would expect that you know, like the neurons would do. And this is one of the points of their paper is that what the, the, what um, they brought now into uh, into light is the neural dynamics. So at the very beginning, of course, there is stronger coding for phases. But over time, as the areas higher up in the hierarchy kick in, they start claiming away, and therefore the selectivity goes down. So two, two things. One is that you know it's hard to pull apart the explaining away um, from adaptation, and there could be different time courses of adaptation in these brain areas. Um, but secondly, I think more important is that what we actually have here are two different predictions for what's in the paper, one from each of you, and we could look at the paper and right. compute the prediction Absolutely. error. <laughs> I think, I think. Absolutely. I, rem I remember that in that paper, they do say at some point 
that it's against the predictive coding story. But that's because they're comparing it with the Round Ballard predictive coding story, and they haven't got anything like precision weighting or anything like that in the story. Right, well, I mean, and precision weighting, of course, is the knob in these stories that lets you flip between heavy bottom-up influence and heavy top-down influence. So it's not like we haven't got a knob. We've got a, got a knob. I agree if you have a general enough <laughs> definition of what predictive coding it encompasses, then... Well, let's have yeah. 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 OK, uh, yes? So this point have you spent... Sorry. <laughs> Despite having spent a lot of time working on feedforward network, I'm actually a big fan of uh, hierarchical predictive coding as a concept. But uh, the word learning has not been pronounced by any of you, as far as I remember. The word what? Learning. 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 Yes. And could it be that yeah. the feedback connections are primarily used for learning, adaptation, and things like that, as opposed to uh, inference? So, um, sure, there, there's got to be some of that in there. Um, part of uh, what I'm really interested in about this is um, prediction error, but prediction over time error as a, um, as a signal that can be used for learning. Uh, so you and I have talked about that, and you, you told me, Jan, that this in the, in, the, in the artificial neural nets literature is called target propagation as opposed to back propagation. And I think that's a really interesting idea, that you, you imagine that each neuron or each little population of neurons is predicting forward in time what those neurons' responses are going to be, um, and then you actually find out what the responses are an instant later in time or in higher brain areas some longer amount of time uh, later. And that's a learning signal. Um, so, so, so to the extent that, that there's a mismatch there, um, then you want to change or update you know, in, in the kind of thing that I implemented, which is you know, a, an elaboration of a deep net. Uh, you want to change the weights. Um, uh, so, so, but, but it's not a backprop learning. It's a, it's a, it's a temporal. Uh, you know, more analogous to temporal difference learning and in, in, in reinforcement learning than it is to, to backprop learning. Oh. Yeah, maybe I could, could I just say a little something to that? So, so I think that learning is, is hugely important here. Of course, it's one of the things, you know, the prediction error signal is something you can self-organize around, you can use it to drive learning. Um, I think we should also think about things like um, transfer to sort of um, near variant situations. And so, um, I'm thinking here, for example, about um, uh, Delete George's stuff on, on breaking capture, that kind of thing, where what you're doing is by, if you like, engaging in this sort of generative model-based learning, you end up learning something which is actually rather more abstract and generalizable than you would get from just doing the sort of the ordinary kind of feed-forward convolutional mapping. Um, so that's the, the main reason why I think that there's a sort of extra power in these stories, which I think is exactly what you're saying there, as far as I can yeah. see. So, yeah. uh, well, Jan, Jan's question was also partly what I was thinking, but just to add a little bit to it, um, I guess two things. One, um, as far as I know, most of the evidence about feedback in the brain, uh, between at least between brain areas, does not really suggest that what's being fed back are precise predictions of the kind that would be, you know, matched to the cells that were sending forward their uh, their original responses. They seem to be more in the nature of learning signals, uh, adaptation signals, gain control signals, things that are modifying. Uh, uh, contextual state, attention, things like that. So, so I think, that, so it's not, it's always been unclear to me how to think about predictive coding in the Rao and Ballard sense. It just seems to me that there's no evidence for it. Um, but prediction, I think, as Jan said, the, the key thing is, is that it's, uh, it's critical for learning. And Bayesian theory, which I'm, of course, very fond of, um, is a static theory that doesn't tell us how to learn anything. It just tells us that we're supposed to be mixing together priors and, and uh, incoming measurements. Uh, but it doesn't tell us where the priors come from or how to represent them, how to actually compute with them. So the idea that we can use uh, something like prediction in the context of learning seems pretty appealing and, and really pretty essential. Do you mean prediction over time, or do you mean context? Time. Agreed. Let me comment on the on the evidence, at least for the feedback. So the 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 there is three at least four papers from the Keller's group that are beautiful. So they describe the whole circuit. In this paper that I cite here, I just show the responses in B one. 
they, they did not only image B1 in that case, they also image ACC, which is a source of top-down projections. They image the axons and how they connect with B1. Right, so they can actually really tell you how the predictions are actually in a, in a, spe in a special map or in a specific you know, vision map. And they're precisely targeted and per cell? Well, I mean, it's hard to, you know, like, you know. I, I doubt it. Well, there I just can, isn't well, the connectivity well, to do I can that. Tell you, so in that paper that I cite, no. But there is one where they actually look at efference copy, right? And in that case, they, they, they really are precisely targeted. In that case, they could actually map them. You know, so, so there is a cell report paper from last year. So in that one, they couldn't. They just know that at least the axons that they can look in B1 have, have precise information, but they cannot tell if this one-to-one. -one. In the other paper, they can actually turn the cell on and off with optogenetics, and actually the behavior changes. So that I can tell you that for sure that, you know, but, this is, but you would say, well, this wasn't a visual, a top-down in the visual sense. It was more model, motor visual, right? But still. I mean, it's a, so, the, so the evidence is there, and as I said, like, you know, I think that one of the things that is happening recently is that there is more accumulating evidence for exactly the kind of claims, that, the kind of questions that you're asking. Because before it was, whatever, fMRI, EMG, EEG, which is fine, but for, to arbitrate for this year, you have to look for precise connectivity patterns and for precise timing of those, of those connectivity patterns. So it's not just anything, right? So. That said, I guess what I would expect is just good enough prediction. I mean, because there are sort of, you know, complexity penalties in, in these learning systems. So you would really not expect prediction to be any more precise than it needs to be to do the job, whatever the job is. Yeah, I guess this is uh, primarily for, uh, for Andy. Uh, like, like Michael, I, mean, I feel a lot of sympathy for the generic Bayesian. Can you hear him back there? Yeah. yeah. Like Michael, I feel a lot of sympathy for the generic Bayesian model, and I'm, you know, just wondering about the, uh, the more specific hierarchy, I mean, the, the more specific predictive coding slash processing framework. One, and the, I'm thinking about what the extra commitments are then of the predictive model as you're, uh, as you're seeing it. One of them is the kind of particular algorithm for, implement, for being Bayesian at the computational level, which as everyone's pointed out, is consistent with many different things going on at the algorithmic and perhaps the neurobiological level and so one question is the uh, is whether you're using so something that counts as a hierarchical predictive coding algorithm but beyond that um, there are a bunch of claims at least that you want to make that seem to be you know, a little bit fuzzier but somehow have something to do with the uh, the priority of prediction in the cognitive system and at least in in uh, you know, in your hands like, I mean in your talk I think it took one main form where you said it's a uh, prediction that's doing the heavy lifting and the other stuff, the, the prediction error, the sensory input, it's just a, what was it, a gentle tweak? A corrective. Uh, yeah. A yeah. Corrective. Yeah. A corrective or a gentle tweak. I was at least tempted to think that, uh, that uh, you know, that was somehow the getting it the wrong way around and that, in fact, what you're calling this little corrective or a gentle tweak is actually doing what looks to me like the, an awful lot of heavy lifting and actually, you know, for example, making the, the differences between specific perceptual states in a, in a dynamic and surprising environment and so on, and that the, uh, you know, predictions priors provide an awful lot of very important generative background structure, but what actually makes, what does the heavy lifting and moment-to-moment -moment differences in perception, for example, by this framework may well be something like the sensory, uh, sensory input. And if you follow by these algorithms, follow this algorithm, the prediction error. The other, the other point, though, where you want to bring in uh, the priority of prediction maybe didn't come out quite so much today, but I sort of hear this, I think at least some of the time from stuff you say, which is somehow the brain is a prediction machine and so, as if the fundamental telos of the brain or of perception in this case is, is prediction. What the brain is fundamentally trying to do is prediction and that kind of drives everything else that it does or in perception that's kind of drives everything else that goes on in, uh, in perception. And that seems kind of an optional claim too. You could think that Oh, the telos of the brain is, you know, getting food or getting sex or getting pleasure or surviving or whatever. And here is a, uh, and here is a really good, here is a really good system that the, uh, that you know, perceptual machinery came up with in order to, uh, to get those things. But at least it seems to be part of your, your framework. At least if I'm understanding you correctly, that, that you know, it's that prediction is actually the telos of the brain. So I guess I just want to, in that case, I want to see if, if I'm interpreting you correctly. And I just want to get clearer on what the arguments are for. Those okay, plans. cool. So there's a, a bunch of things there. The first thing about the um, about my 
sort of fuzzy claims about heavy lifting being done by prediction and, uh, and light lifting being done by the incoming sensory stuff translated into prediction error. So that's the idea, that the incoming stuff gets rapidly translated into pr prediction error. That, of course, is carrying sensory information. Um, but what, it's, what it has to be computed against is a complicated model that has, for instance, lots of information about how one object could occlude another object, that sort of thing. So, you know, if I'm going to see what's in front of me, I need to understand a lot of stuff about occlusion and about, you know, the properties of objects. So that's the idea of the heavy lifting, as it were. That's all in the generative model. Um, what's coming in out there is just stuff that lets me get that stuff going in the right way at the right time. That's at least the picture that I'm, um, that I'm trying to go for. Um, so the other thing, what was the other thing you were asking? It was the T loss. T loss, yeah. yeah. Like the brain as a prediction machine. Well, you know, I think what I, you can always ask about the T loss of the T loss because, you know, I think that the reason that the brain's a prediction machine is because we've got to choose the next action. That's what, that's what I think brains are really about. They're about choosing the next thing to do, given, um, <laughs> given where you are right now. Um, it turns out that trying to minimize prediction error over time seems to be a very good way to become organized in a sort of way that lets you choose the next thing to do. Um, so it's, so I don't really know where the T loss is if you ask, yeah, I'm going to say, okay, choosing the next thing to do, but the, the universal recipe for that is to minimize prediction error because it's the only thing you can get your hands on. The one thing that a biological brain can do is try and predict how stuff is and then update itself on the basis of how the sensory flow then goes. That's, that's the kind of picture of, of what it is to be in contact with the world. That's the only contact with the world that, uh, that we can self-organize around. That's the kind of thought. Can, I just wanted to yeah. cut in on this, because this is yeah. something I've wondered yeah. about also from, from reading yeah. your... Because when I first read your BBS paper, the, that was sort of my reaction was, well, okay, maybe prediction is how this is happening, but if you're just looking at the perceptual system, there is a more fundamental telos that we should be emphasizing, which is estimation which is that it's trying to estimate what the distal conditions are, and that, going back to Helmholtz, has been... Estimate the, so that you can act. Well, okay, may, maybe, perhaps, but, but, I mean, certainly if you just look at the job of the perceptual system on its own, what it's trying to do, and these Bayesian norms, these are norms for good estimation of, of, you know, in this case, environmental conditions. So it seems to me that, like, some of the stuff you say is too emphasizing prediction at the expense of estimation, which is the more fundamental thing driving. In terms of the action, though, some of the stuff you were saying, there is something else you can do besides the prediction, which is you could have desires or, like, a cost function. And that's not, I don't think it's right to assimilate that. I mean, we're just being perception, but I don't think it's right to assimilate trying to like, maximize utility, minimize the cost function, to prediction error minimization. I think these are different things, and that, that it's sort of, it's blurring, it's blurring the, the norms together, it's blur, blurring the telos together, to, to lose that side of it. You could translate it, any cost function into a set of priors. So. Mathematically, but that doesn't mean that in terms of the sort of functional role and in, in terms of the norms governing it, that just because thing, I mean, there are all sorts of cases where you have the same mathematical form to do things, but they're very different and more explanatory level. Just on the, the point about the heavy lifting. I just okay, want to, back um, to the heavy lifting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not quite getting the sense in which one is the, uh, one is the heavy lifting. It strikes me it's a bit like saying, uh, you know, the stomach is doing the heavy lifting and digestion. The food, whatever, the food is providing a, gen a mere gentle tweak to the, uh, <laughs> to, the, uh, to the stomach. It's like, well, yeah, you need the stomach. It's doing really important stuff. Yeah, you need the food and the mouth and the throat. If my stomach was trying to construct a, a, a sort of a, a virtual version of the food in a complex, nonlinear way, then I'd, I'd be on board with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the problems about this kind of model is that the whole brain is the interactive bottom-up, top-down. Multiple, multiple layers before you get to the one public layer where we say something, yes, it was a cow or it was a horse. And I'm pleased to see that we're finally getting to the prefrontal and frontal cortex participation in this process. But the whole brain is bottom up, top down. And these models, and those parts can be computed precisely. They're not just pushing or additive, they are interactive. They fight and they not only are top down, bottom up, but they're laterally within each area. And so we've got six or seven layers before we get to the public layer. Yeah. 
And if you go to the Liabra model of the emergent models, you can, we can see how these things are computed precisely. And the models that you've got are really klutzy compared to those. Really, really klutzy. And I suggest that if you want to see how these things are, the problem is that you don't have a hard hold on the top-down representation. You have to so, guess what it's like. If you're looking at word recognition, mm -hmm. there's an, layers that say, is this a G, or is this an E, or is this an F? That's top-down fighting with the layers below that. The whole brain is like that. Right. I must I, say, I, about 40 sure years ago, there was an article in Science Okay, you have to wind up. That said, they, there were in many places, there were 10 times as many top-down neurons as bottom-up. Why is that? That's 40 years ago. But that's the whole brain, and this is still okay, so ignored should, yeah. in perceptual models. Well, so this is just a special case. Yeah. And I think you should learn from the lower stuff um, how this might be computed. The reason that we're talking about um, hierarchical predictive coding and perception here is just because we were told to because that's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, actually you know these these models are applied to the to the whole brain and you know prefrontal cortex there's some beautiful work on prefrontal cortex using a single parameterization using a predict a hierarchical predictive coding kind of story that gets a whole lot of different prefrontal cortex effects out of one parameterization um, so I think you know it's uh, I, I until you said how clumsy it was, I was just thinking, yeah, that's right, everything you're saying. Exactly. It yeah. doesn't just add or it doesn't just predict. They fight to see which is the winner of each layer. And it's not a case of the error yeah. because you have the information. Okay. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. I think that the thing that I published last year is exactly of that form. Um, I'm, I also, just to bring back to Arrow's um, comment, um, you know, the, the, the form of feedback that we're each talking about in maybe some similar and I think different ways uh, is only one type of feedback that we think is there in the brain. There are also, you know, just broadly speaking, executive control uh, functions, controlling attention, uh, cognitive control, um, uh, type, types of, of modulatory um, uh, signals as well. Um, uh, so, w which none of us have touched on here. That, that, that's not part of this story. The, 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 this story is about how, you know, some higher level, more abstract representation, which I would say also has a, a kind of a longer time scale to it, um, feeds back and constrains the bottom-up sensory processing. I, I wonder if the fundamental issue here is whether there's an explicitly, let's say, two different classes of neurons in the earlier areas, one of which is the representation, the other of which is the prediction error, because I do not have that. I have one neuron that, 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 that combines the bottom up with the top down um, in a way that's analogous to, it's not computing probabilities, but you, you can think of it as an, an impl implicit representation uh, of the posterior as opposed to two separate things. I, I, I think what you have in mind, at least Andy, is something that looks a lot like an adversarial network in which there's a bottom-up flow and a top-down flow, which was represented by two different, which would be represented by two different subpopulations of neurons. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have to be subpopulations of neurons, but I think there is some emerging evidence that they might be subpopulations of neurons, um, but they do have to be something. They have to be two different somethings. Um, but that's exactly the point I was trying to make, because this is, this is the thing that, for the most part, was troubling me, because they are making these very strong claims with two different sort of mm -hmm. stuff, okay. right? And what is the evidence that we have for that to actually be there? Because mm -hmm. if, there is not, if, if it's not there, then to me, the game is over. <laughs> you know, there's no... Thanks. Um, I was just wondering what the simplest organisms are in which you think predictive coding occurs. Does it occur in all nervous systems, or does it require some sort of fancy complexity before it can be implemented? And I think that if we could answer that question, it might help um, figure out the telos thing that we were just talking about. So I, That's for anyone. So, so uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, um, birds and mammals, I would say. Um, you know, Carl Friston thinks that you can apply his story to plants. I'm not so sure about that. 
Um, that's a broader story there, the free energy story. But in terms of actual sort of hierarchical predictive coding with maybe two different populations of neurons doing this kind of thing, I think that b birds and mammals are the place to look. Uh, I'm just going to come back to it. Depends on what you mean by predictive coding here again, right? Because we're talking about three different things, I think. Um, inference, uh, a prediction over time, and efficient coding and transmission of information. The efficient coding and transmission of information has got to be there in the very simplest nervous systems because they have so few resources to work with. Um, and so to the extent, let, let's, let's assume that the viewpoint represented by that half of the table turns to be a correct description of how the cortex works in mammals and primates, um, then this efficient coding piece of it is embedded with the other pieces of it uh, all being done at the same time. Uh, and we would expect that that efficient, um, that efficient coding uh, piece to be for sure to be there in very simple nervous systems um, where you don't have much, um, much uh, hardware or metabolic activity to power to work with. So just to follow up the discussion of uh, prediction error and the prediction signal. So Andy, since you mentioned that uh, the prediction information is kind of same as the representation unit, right? Mm -hmm. But in my, in my understanding, it's different. Representation unit suppose integrate bottom up and oh, top down yeah. information. But uh, pre uh, Present, uh, prediction signal is just a pure prediction, right? So only when bottom up and top down is the same, the representation signal and the prediction signal are the same. Uh, um, generally, they are they're different. So that. basically, there seems there's three different one. signals. One is prediction error signal. One is prediction signal. One is representation signal, right? No, no. Could you repeat that? Sorry, I'm still having trouble. Even seeing where you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, representation Stand signal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So representation signal, representation signal is supposed to integrate bottom as bottom information and top down information, and prediction predict signal is just top down information, right? Generally, they are different. So oh. in the in the Fristorian model, they, there yeah. is only two, right? Yeah, so I just want to mention, like Andy mentioned, that these are same. I'm I'm trying to, just to say trying to say they are different. So the representation units in this case are the prediction units. Those are the. Oh, that's the, that's the point. I don't agree. I don't, I don't agree. It uh, could be, but you know, I'm, yeah. in the oh, you you were asking for a clarification. In this case, yeah. this is the way in which this model works. It's, um, you know, it could be implemented in different ways. In this particular, uh, you know, instantiation, the representation units hold host the generative model. So in that sense, they are representation at the same time as predictions. Mm -hmm. Right. So also I had another question. So you mentioned like one question per person, please. He's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> He's not joking. Hi, I'm over here. So one thing I was wondering coming into the debate is what is it to explain perception? What is the aspect of perception which requires explanation? And I was wondering that even harder, I guess, when um, Andy made the claim that Predictive coding can explain not just perception, but also imagination and memory through the same mechanisms. And part of me was worrying that there's something in common between explaining something and being a best friend, which is you can't be everybody's best friend, or you don't kind of count as being a best friend. And in a similar way, you might think, if this is really what's explaining perception, then we want it to explain what's distinctive about perception, not just what it has in common with other kind of cognitive functions like memory and imagination. And so you might worry then that what's really doing the work of explaining perception isn't predictive coding, it's whatever features make perception different from these other mechanisms. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about whether that generality is a strength or a weakness. So I guess I think it's a strength because I think you want to say something about, if you like, the, the enormous overlap between the mechanisms for imagination here and the mechanisms for perception. So it's true that there have to be differences. So you have to be able to say something about, um, about what's going on when you're more sequestered from the sensory flow. Um, but if you look at sort of mid-range cases where like the Dalmatian and the sort of, you know, these things where it's very much the case that you're adding, you know, you're carving out the sensory signal, you're separating sort of, um, you're separating noise from signal. 
in ways that are very much influenced by what you know about the world, you know, you just push that a little bit further and you're imagining something that isn't there. You just take, sort of, you know, look up at the clouds and find faces. You just find something and then carve out, um, carve out noise and signal in a way that is very much guided by your, your current project, your top-down thing. So I, th I, I think it's a strength, but I completely agree with you that you don't want to just say they're all the same thing and that's the end of the story. That, you know, that, that would be bad. But I guess it's part of your question was also why imagination feels different from perception, right? And I think that that's, that's a really good point. And that, that actually comes, by, or, you know, why, you know, when I sleep and I am dreaming, it feels different than, you know, like this moment now, right? And, and part of the, you know, even though the theory says that it's the same formula and it's the same uh, implementation in a way, what, what you can actually think of is the differentiation. So on the one hand, you have your generative model, but if you don't have prediction errors, that of course is, is for the brain itself, is different than when actually you do have perception, right? So in a way, like how does that get translate to feelings? It's something that I've been always puzzled about the theory. So the, one of the, you know, if you ask me, like one of the biggest problems, I think for, for this theory is none of the things that we are discussing now, but it's how to explain consciousness, which I don't see how, you know, out of the box, you know, it would, um, it would come out of the theory. None of the, none of the theories, right? Um, but you can think that, you know, like, for the brain, those states are distinguishable, right? Now, why do they feel different? That's a really good question. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to say, because you asked about explaining perception. Um, I mean, for, for, for me, the task is we enter into perceptual states. Like, so, for example, you'll perceive an object as having a certain shape or size or color. And one thing you can mean by explaining perception, which I think is one thing that implicitly a lot of perceptual psychologists are trying to do, is to explain why you perceive something as having a certain shape or size or color. So you want a causal explanation of, you know, why did you enter into this percept and not that percept? And then that starts to engage more with, you know, the philosophical literature on, you know, causal explanation more generally. I mean, there are many options out there. I think that the best kind of view is one which tells you how would the percept have been different had you various antecedent psychological states or features of the stimulus been different. This is the sort of view that James Woodward defends. And you do get this from Bayesian perceptual psychology, which is one of the reasons why it's a, an impressive field. Uh, just following up on that a little bit, I, I like the idea that perception, imagination, dreaming um, are, are really closely related, but I don't quite see where the error signal comes in, where the, in, in, when there's no sensory data coming in. Uh, so where's the prediction error in imagination or dreaming? If there isn't. Well, that's the thing. There isn't. You're sequestered from the sensory signal, so you're um, driving the generative model just by sort of intrinsic cueing. So it's... Um, so I think the picture there is that there, there's, there's, there's no sensory prediction error anyway, that's for sure. I, I think um, the strongest case yeah. is dreams, right? right? Yeah. So, you know, not even, I mean, because in, in imagination you can think, well, there is something out there and I'm putting my generative model on top. In dreams, this is not, I mean, I have my eyes closed, I'm secluded, and I'm still dreaming. On the other hand, so, they're not constant. They're flowing, there's change, there's yes. something making yes. them the move. Yes. Well, but the point here is that, you know, I think, you know, the, what makes you to move, or, or put it differently, like the prediction error in this case, it makes you to adjust the, the model that you have at the current moment. It doesn't necessarily make you to flow from state to state, right? It's your generative model that makes you to flow from state to state. So that same logic would apply while you are awake versus when you are asleep. That's not, that's not the part of the prediction errors per se. It's not, the, they are not the ones that drive you, now do this, now, you, now do that, is the generative model. So um, I just wanted to go back to the exchange between uh, Dave and Andy. So, um, so in response to Dave um, about this question in the sense in which there's heavy lifting from prediction, um, uh, the kinds of priors that you were mentioning as part of the gen generative model are like sort of generic priors about how the world works, like light comes from above or things to do with occlusion between objects and so on. Um, but the, this, this rhetoric of 
controlled hallucination very much makes it sound like um, we're also talking about priors about the specific scene that's in front of the subject um, at the time of perception, not just generic information about the environment. Um, but um, but it seems like um, surely what's happening in typical typical case is that to begin with, when the subject's confronted with the environment, all the gain is bottom up, at least initially, and then you have this kind of recursive process where you get these priors about what the environment is like that uh, um, are based on you know, initial perceptual information. But to begin with, surely in a typical situation, uh, it's fee forward first, and then you get the kind of rec recursive processing happening. Um, and so, or maybe you don't agree with that, but this is, this is my, qu my question for you. What's the sense in which there's a kind of priority of priors about the specific scene in front of the subject, not just generic priors about the environment? Yeah, I don't think you can really cut the process in cycle like that, you know? I mean, it's not like the brain is kind of suddenly turned on from nowhere, at least most of the time as I roll through the world, I'm clearly building up a picture of how things are, taking in information relative to that picture. Um, even if you did something weird, like kidnapped me and blindfolded me and sort of let me open my eyes in an unexpected scene, I would still, I think, be having some expectations about being in a world like this. I'd get very rapid, um, sort of, um, very broad kinds of information about the, the sort of sufficient statistics of the scene that might say mm -hmm. something, drive me to think that I'm sort of in the countryside or in a built-up city scene or something like that. That would let me generate more specific predictions and start to see where I am. But I think it's, um, you know, I don't think it would be right to think that, as it were, you ever really just start with the with the incoming sensory signal and then sort of find the predictions. At least if these stories are right, you're always trying to deal with that signal on the basis of predictions, no matter how far away they may be from what's actually out there. Um, I mean, I, I envision it differently. Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, um, we think of there as being uh, environmental priors that are learned either through experience or through um, evolution um, that uh, characterize, for example, you know, the relative likelihood of running across edges that are vertical and horizontal versus diagonal or the speed of things uh, moving in the environment around you. Um, uh, and and those, those we can think of as being sort of somehow hardwired into the processing, whether it's entirely feed forward or not, okay? Um, on the on the other point, uh, I I I I I think I completely agree with your sentiment, which is that um, I think there needs to be a specific mechanism for dealing with situations in which, oh my God, all the predictions are wrong. What do I do now? Right? Um, and and this is a role for what I see as being prediction error signals. As, as essentially changing the arousal state, which in my mind is turning this knob so that the, so, so that the whole system then behaves essentially like a deep net or you know, an elaborated version of that as a, as a fast feed forward processing from which you, you can't get all the information, but you can glean some things in order to get a foot in the door. Uh, and then as that starts taking hold, the knob gets turned back the other direction um, uh, to be combining now um, predictions over time and context uh, from a model um, with the now newly incoming sensory information. Now, where, where does the model come from, right? So that's something that none of us really talked about or made explicit. Um, the, the way that I think about it is it, it, we, we, we actually described it implicitly. So if you just have a deep net, right, what's a deep net? It's a bunch of weighted sums and simple rectification nonlinearities, which is trained, the weights and the weighted sums are trained, um, you know, so that you do a good job of, say, classifying cats and dogs or handwritten digits, um, okay? Um, so that's effectively a model when you're done training it. Those weights are a model, right? That, that's capturing statistics of the, your environment, pictures of cats and dogs or pictures of handwritten digits, um, and the relationships between them that allows you to, at the top of the thing, do a classification, okay? Um, 
so the, the idea here, I think in both versions of this, um, is, that the, is that that model can be run backwards as well as forwards. Uh, and, and, that, and that's also the idea that's in these um, general, generalized adversarial network, neural, neural, artificial neural net uh, uh, techniques, um, uh, uh, technology that you may have heard about and that Andy showed uh, some, some, some examples of. Okay, um, so so um, so those need to be learned, right? But there's there's no magic there, right? Um, but the idea here that I have in mind is that there's a knob that gets turned, and depending on how well you're doing in interpreting your environment, if there's a lot of stuff that's popping up with uncertainty, then you turn that knob way over. Uh, and in the Bayesian version of things, you're relying heavily on the likelihood, okay, and downweighting the contribution of the prior. Uh, and in other situations, you'd turn it the other way. Well, I think that is saying roughly the same I, I thing. Think as your, kind of your I think we're in agreement. I think we're in agreement on, on, the, that. on the prediction yeah. error from the incoming sensor. Yeah, I, I don't imagine yeah, that we would be particularly yeah. disagreeing on any of that. I was just trying to clarify. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask. Um, I'm actually an outsider. I'm not from academia, but I would like to ask about prediction error. Uh, why, in some situations? brain request to increase prediction error, like in taking drugs or drinking, and uh, <clears throat> or uh, enjoy surprises, and doesn't seem to uh, um, increase predictability and um, uh, uh, trying to build a correct model of the environment. We, we all have things to say about that, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, so you know, I think you're right. We do sometimes um, seek out sort of uh, places where we can minimize more prediction error than we expected to be minimizing. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I, there's a, a research program in artificial curiosity, um, and the kind of idea there is that um, you want to find the bits of the world where you can improve your generative model better, you know, best of all, if you like. And they won't be the bits that are already highly predictable nor the bits that are unpredictable. You'll be looking for places where you get error and you can improve the model in that sort of way. So to reduce prediction error well over the very long term, what you want to do is sometimes in the short term deliberately increase prediction error so you can get rid of it. I think that's, that's what I would say there. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about drinking. Sounds like a good idea, but... <laughs> uh, I have a question, like... I think like the predictive error, what you're saying will make a lot of sense when you're actually doing predictions for robots or even say animal okay. studies. It will be quite accurate. But when I think like when you're doing it on say, uh, some human beings, I think there can be uh, the, diff the, like, the predictions may not be very accurate. Like suppose you see the same movie like today and after seven days, you'll be having a different interpretation maybe. So I think there is a big role of context. That's one thing. And also because like humans have a sense of time which I think like animals or robots don't have. And since because of that, and there can be other fluctuations through thoughts, you will not actually have, a, you have basically prediction error will not be the same thing. Like over a period of time, you may think like there can be a sigma, you can say one or zero, but like uh, there'll be still the one and zero differences can be much more, the, the variance is much more possible in humans rather than animals because of the sense of time. That's what I think. Like, like I just let to you know your views on this. I'm not sure where you got here. Well, let, let me clarify what I'm thinking about as prediction error, okay? And, and, you can, and so, so if, if you sit there and just move your head slowly back and forth, okay, um, the image changes in predictable ways. There's statistical structure in the environment, okay? Um, uh, and the sensory neurons that are, I think, encoding, representing information about the visual environment, uh, that includes, for example, distance, right, um, uh, and shape. Um, that if there's a representation somewhere in your head of the three-dimensional structure uh, or something about the three-dimensional structure of the scene in front of you, including relative distance and occlusion boundaries, then as you move your head back and forth, there's predictable changes um, in, 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 in the image. So that's very different from that, and that's pretty low level, right? Um, you know, even lower level is uh, uh, I, I, I know what the... What the um, Intensity of the light is at one location hitting my cornea, uh, 
right? Um, uh, let's say I don't know the intensity of that one point, but I do know the intensity of the points around it, okay? Um, how good a job can I do of predicting what that light intensity is from the neighboring spatial positions? Well, most of the time you can do pretty well because of the correlations and the statistical structure of the kinds of images that happen in the real world. If images were random numbers, then you wouldn't be able to do that, but the world isn't made up of random numbers in just the same way that as when I move my head back and forth, random things don't typically happen, um, unless you've maybe had too much to drink. Um, uh, okay, so, so, so I'm thinking about prediction and prediction error over time at, 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 this, at, uh, at this very kind of low basic sensory level. Um, in addition to maybe the kind of higher level cognitive things that you're thinking about over long time periods uh, and, and, and different task contexts. Does that help? Okay, I think we've run out of time. So let's thank our panelists. And there will now be a reception um, in the <laughs> philosophy department, which is 5 Washington Place on the sixth floor. Uh, so there will be uh, food and drink. And everybody's invited. Yeah, it's just two blocks from here.